The information in this podcast is current on the day of recording. It is general advice only and does not take a personal situation into account. It may not be suitable for you. Welcome to Stock Take. My name is Gaurav Sodi, and with me today is analyst Nick Cummings. Hey, Nick. Hi, Gaurav. How are you? Not bad, thank you. And our Vancouver correspondent, Graham. Welcome, Graham. Hey, Gaurav. Nick, the filing cabinet's gone. What happened? Is, there, is it I okay? I think everyone's asking. Everyone wants to know, is, is the cabinet <laughs> all right? It's in the spare room, much to the dismay of my girlfriend. But um, mm. yeah, I got an interior design tip from John, and uh, it's been replaced now with a beautiful photo. <laughs> That's a nice it. story. <laughs> yeah. I suspect Surely the filing cabinet feels more corporate and business oriented. Absolutely. I think, what, I think what really happened was that they got a bad result and the filing cabinet took the bulk of his disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> the poor yeah. thing is probably in recovery somewhere in another room. Yeah, I won't show you my hands. <laughs> <laughs> Now, um, we are in the middle of reporting season, um, and as usual, every comp- all of our companies tend to result in clusters. So um, this week, I've had about 15 companies report. I think, Graham, last week, you were really busy. And Nick, you've got these quarterly reports for the uh, American stuff. Um, so you can't, you have that every couple of months, which is even worse. I thought what we'd do today is just do a round robin of some of the interesting results. We're far enough into reporting season now that we've had a a good idea of, of what a good result and bad result looks like. And there's some um, interesting observations to make. So Graham, let's begin with you. What have you bought for us well, today? Uh, Cochlear, everyone's favorite hearing implant provider, uh, which has a 60% <laughs> share of the market. So you don't have very much choice, but mm. it is a good company. And uh, yeah, this past result was, was pretty good. It had a lot of difficulty through the pandemic because People weren't able to go to hospitals. They weren't able to get the implants. They weren't able to get tested either, which meant that there was kind of a um, shortage of the top end of the funnel for them. But yeah, it was it was a good result because all of that seems to have recovered uh, dramatically uh, since then. They had a sixteen percent increase in the implants themselves, which mm-hmm. is yeah quite above average. Part of that was due to just the increase in capacity again that they could get people into surgery. But also there was a some uh, catch up from a, the backlog of surgeries through the pandemic. Mm. So probably we don't need to, you couldn't expect that to continue indefinitely, but it's nice to see that they're getting back on their feet since the, the difficulty during the pandemic. And they also had actually a bumper. Oh, go ahead. No, no, could, could finish off and, I'll, and I've got a question for you afterwards. But yeah, let's um, like oh, to do I was just the bumper. Say, yeah, they also, <laughs> I left you hanging. <laughs> Yeah. They also had a bump a year for uh, their services division, which, yeah, that had a 16% rise in uh, revenue. But there's a little bit of, uh, you need to kind of break that down a little bit because they released a new processor this year, the Nucleus 8, mm. which which does kind of lead to a big increase in sales. But also because people knew that it was coming out, last year's sales were a little bit depressed because uh, people think, oh, well, I'll just wait till next year before upgrading. That sounds so, familiar. Are there, are there lines forming outside yeah. hospitals, people queuing overnight to get that nucleus eight? I'm sure the the people, the demographic getting cochlear implants is definitely as as crazy as Apple fans. <laughs> I wonder if um, what impact Taylor Swift will have ultimately on the cochlear market. You know, these concerts are just, we're, I'm going to see Lauren Hill later um, this year. Oh, and cool. That's, that's probably not as loud as other concerts, but I've been to concerts that are just, just deafening. I do not understand why they need to be so bloody loud. And, uh, I thought and... you were going a different direction. I thought you were going to say that she's going to partner with them and beam her concert straight into people's brains. <laughs> oh, and... that's even better. That's <laughs> a better that idea. Way. No, I thought there might be some subtle conspiracy between cochlear and the recording industry. Just blast our ears and damage them mm. and increase sales. If I were tinfoil, if I was a tinfoil kind of guy, you know, if I have, was was ranting here that's your on hat. my own YouTube channel. <laughs> That, that's, that's something I might go with. But fortunately, Graham, we, we are not. Um, look, the question I had for you, actually, was I remember a few years ago, you were speaking about um, a Chinese competitor. And there was talk of um, uh, a low-cost challenger out of Asia, specifically out of China, challenging cochlear. Has that impacted cochlear at all? Has that really been um, a nothing? Uh, not really. I mean, cochlear's market share has actually been increasing 
very, mm. very slightly. And you can't expect it to really get much, much higher. It's it's basically at its max in terms of market share. Uh, however, because they have such a, a lead on the rest of the market in terms of innovation, the it, it doesn't get the same effect as, say, uh, I don't know, a laptop that can kind of be cloned or something by a cheaper Chinese competitor. Yeah. And then that gives people the option. With this, it's it's first of all, very, very personal. It's literally mm -hmm. being implanted in your head. Yeah. So yeah. people aren't going for the lowest cost option anyway. Yeah. Plus it's being paid for by the insurer. So you're not mm -hmm. really on the hook for a lot of the cost anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Cochlear just has a huge lead in terms of getting the best devices, the best responses, the best, the smallest devices and all of that. So yeah, I don't think that they're at much threat from from competitors. They they count for almost all of the industry's research spending, basically. Oh wow. So okay. yeah, they they have a good lead. Wow, that nuclear state must be something. Um, Nick, shall we move on from uh, Cochlear? And, and Nick, you've got a, a stock as well. I'm keen to hear about this one, actually. Yeah, sure. So the one I'm bringing is Reese. Um, mm. It had a very good result if you just look at the numbers. So revenue was up 11%, um, uh, excluding foreign currency, but, and profits were up about the same. But digging deeper, there was a clear... Um, mix between the first half and the second half. So the first half was extremely strong. The second half was um, about flat. And then management pretty much said that the second half trends have continued into the new year, uh, into the new financial year. Mm. And this year's um, going to be quite weak. So to get to their 11% revenue growth last year, volumes were actually flat. It was all price increases. So as a distributor, sits between the supplier and sort of a tradesman and the tradesmen were quite busy and are quite time poor so they accepted the price increases and eventually we at the consumer um you know it gets all passed through the chain but this year volumes are expected to decline but prices are expected or price inflation is expected to moderate so revenue could actually decline this year for the first time in a wow. while yeah yeah and Management also said they're getting, they're still experiencing cost inflation, particularly in wages. So margins could get squeezed as well, mm. um, which means there could be a, a fair earnings decline this year. I guess the good thing or the, uh, you know, the optimistic view if you're a risk shareholder, there's still a huge opportunity in the US and management are a classic founder owner team and they don't really care about next year's profits. They're looking at this business in 10 years. And they gave a quite eye-opening recap of the U.S. Um, division so far. So they acquired it five years ago. Uh, since then, operating profits are up threefold. Sales are up 80%. And now the goal is to actually expand more into the repair and remodel segment that's more resilient. Uh, that's where they've been so successful in Australia. Uh, and a play like Ferguson that we cover in, um, internationally has mm -hmm. doubled the margins of Reese and are more exposed to that market. So any inroads there will be will be good for margins. Um, management strategy there is actually to roll out the Reese brand in the US. So they've already done this in California. So all the Californian stores are now branded Reese. Uh, and the goal by 2030 is to have every store branded as Reese and really go after the um, sort of smaller, um, not small suppliers, sorry, but smaller customers, so the smaller tradesmen, because at the moment, the concentration is residential and commercial construction, and they're dealing with larger suppliers, at, and that's why the margins uh, are yeah. lower, right, as right. well as a, a lower store density as well. Um, the disappointing thing, I guess, <laughs> from my point of view, is this is a wonderful business. Uh, we you know, love to upgrade it, but it's at 40 times earnings, and earnings mm. are going to decline, and it's mm. just, you know, pissing me off a bit. <laughs> that's hard to believe, actually. I mean, that American housing market, has just had an, a remarkable year when you consider the backdrop. James Hardy, I think, is up sixty percent of the year. All those mm. American housing stocks, I think, are trading at all-time highs. Through it's it's remarkable. It's it's crazy, and you've got players like Reese coming in saying your conditions are worsening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you <laughs> think the share, the share price is flat? <laughs> has uh, um, is the same message coming from Ferguson as well, or is this uh, yes. specific? Yep, yep. Okay. No, yeah, yeah. It's industry wide. Yeah. Wow. There are moments like that when. Um, management's trying to tell you something 
and the market's just refusing to listen. I've I've had that yeah. experience as well. Um, we yeah. talked about this before, but um, when TPG was um, rolling off um, its own um, its own infrastructure and onto the NBN, it was moving from being a reseller of its own services to a reseller. Uh, sorry, a provider of its own services to a reseller of the NBN, and its margin profile was about to change dramatically. And for about three years, management was telling the analyst community guys, our margins are going to fall. Our margins are going to fall. Don't expect these margins to last. And nothing happened. And then one year when their margins fell, everyone panicked and the stock price crashed. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, yeah, what's going Didn't on see it coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. all this efficiency we see in the markets is sometimes punctured by just dumbness. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. Okay. Well, um, yeah, we're going to, I'd like to keep an eye on Reese. That sounds really fascinating. I could see a, a, a big, um, a big change coming from them. Okay, I've brought along um, one of my favorite stocks, which is um, Lavisa, which um, keen observers will know that we've kept on the buy list, even though the price has exceeded the official buy recommendation. And that's because I just wanted to give it a bit more cheeky leeway because I actually think this is a, a fantastic opportunity um, and one that doesn't come along, along very often. Lavisa is just on a tear. I, I thought these results were were fantastic. Um, every, all the numbers were great. Revenue was up. Margins are actually stronger. Gross margins reverted back to 80%. Um, there have been 200 stores in the year, 200 stores. They're, um, they're now in 39 countries. And you just compare that to where they were three years ago. Three years ago, they had, um, I think, 40 stores in the US, and now they have 190. Um, they must have an incredible management structure to be able to handle that kind of uh, growth rate, like I can't get my they head must be thinking of a new. Yeah, how can they operate so quickly? Just finding the sites at that rate. Well, this is what I struggle with sometimes. I mean, let's think about the mechanics of of this and what's involved. They have to have a leasing team getting somewhere on the ground and make striking deals with two hundred um, different locations. They have to have logistics in place because these guys are famous for their very quick delivery and fast inventory turnover. So they need logistics in place to be able to supply inventory and turn it over all the time. And then they need some sort of um, data acquisition in the area so they can monitor uh, what's selling and feed that back into their designers as well. I mean, all that happens simultaneously, it seems like. I, I don't, it's 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 almost like magic. I don't quite understand how they're doing this. But it, do, it's- Do you think that they're, do you think that they're kind of taking a shotgun approach and then thinning out the the poorly performing stores or are they actually putting in a lot of research at the start to find the best sites? I think there's a bit of both going on. I do. Th you look at the store closure. So there's, they closed um, uh, five stores in the US. They closed 30 stores across their network. The company does do a bit of trial and error, and it's very quick to close down stores that aren't working. And that's something I really like about the business. They don't sit there and operate loss-making stores. If it becomes apparent that the store isn't working, they quickly shut it down. They, they famously left Spain altogether. And this year they reintroduced, they re-entered Spain um, with a single store. And I just think they might be testing that strategy again with different locations and maybe different um, different strategy. It's too big a market to really ignore. Um, a couple of things really stood out um, for me for the result. One was that um, this store growth, I think it's it's 200 stores per year is, is sustainable. The American network is only 190 stores. It's now the largest in, now largest territory in that network. And I think you can you can add another zero to that pretty comfortably over time. There's a lot of very large markets that have a tiny store penetration, and that's clearly them testing the market um, and then preparing for much stronger openings. Mexico has, I think, it was seven stores. Italy has like four stores. These are big markets um, that have tiny store footprints and can potentially increase a lot. And the other thing um, operationally was that um, Lavisa used to, in, in Europe, they used to outsource their logistics and they've now um, built a large logistics warehouse, a distribution warehouse in Poland. And um, that should serve, that should make it easier for them to roll out stores all across the European continent. Mm -hmm. Now, they're really positive that they, they've taken the investment to internalize logistics. It, it shows a real commitment to Europe. And I think Europe sometimes gets forgotten um, inside that uh, amazing network, that was um, one market that surprised me. Actually, Poland. Poland, yes, that, that going from did, one that, store to eighteen. 
it just shows you that they can really accelerate that rollout when it is working. And I think this is the key to wrapping your head around this. I mean, it's not easy buying a retailer with no obvious moat at 35 times earnings we're talking about. But what you have to realize is that the company is just continuing doing what it's doing. It's not, we're not actually asking the business to do anything new and nothing changes. They've shown that they can, they have the logistical and managerial know how to grow the network. They've shown that they can open in markets across cultures and across geographies. And I, from, from my point of view, we're just um, doing the same thing. Um, and when you run the numbers through that, PE comes down awfully quick. Um, I think in two years' time, when I ran some basic assumptions, it's it's back at twenty times earnings. You know, um, so that that seems perfectly reasonable to me. I think there's a, a long runway here for growth. Um, you know, I'm I'm still pretty positive on it. I, I think the the team is probably less. Uh, there's probably more controversy about how how large and how successful the Visa can get. Um, but uh, it's it's I will disclose it's my largest position by some way. Personally, I parlayed a lot of coal gains back into La Visa. <laughs> it's the only stock I can think of where I've bought that at two dollars something, and I bought it at twenty dollars something, and, and still um, felt you were getting a good deal. <laughs> yeah, well, well I, I can't think of any other stock where there's a ten x difference in my purchase price, and I'm still perfect, really, really excited and happy about it. So, um, yeah, I the... kick myself with that one because I remember when it was. I probably came a bit later to it when it was in mm. the three dollars, but I just remember thinking it it kind of is beyond belief a little bit. Mm. And so I didn't do anything with it. But then it lived up to all those <laughs> claims and expectations. Uh, yeah. And now it feels the same. It's like it's a bit beyond belief. But I I was mistaken the first time. So Yeah. Get yourself some LaVisa, Graham. Um, the market hated the yeah. result, I've got to say. I, I, I don't understand the reaction to this result. The, market, the share price was down 6% on the day. And it was because the last... Uh, the first seven weeks of the new financial year, um, the company re recorded um, a decline of same store sales growth of about 6%. Um, and I think that freaked the market out. And they did speak about um, slower sales growth throughout the network in this period. And I think that did freak the, the market out. Um, but, you know, when you think about what was going on, you know, the the Mac, this, we're clearly going through a bit of a cyclical funk internationally. Mm -hmm. And... In the last period, um, we're cycling numbers that included a big COVID, post-COVID boost. So, you know, that, that's a it's a tall order to match that growth. And I was I was actually okay with um, a minus six percent figure. I actually, I think there was some prospect it could have been in double digits, um, and I still would have been okay with it. But for the decline to only be five six percent was fine. Um, Yes, I'm pretty happy with this one. I thought it was a great result. Um, don't know. I think the market's got it wrong. I'm just going to say it. Um, the market's wrong about it, um, and and I'm more than happy to to have a big wading into it myself. Um, any questions? Let's move yeah, on. No, uh, sounds good. Graham, what's your number two? Number two for me is Sonic. It's one oh. of our buy recommendations. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it didn't have well. I don't know. It's another case where the market kind of thought it was a bit worse than I did. I think uh, it's it's net profit halved, which that sounds sound pretty great. bad so far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're not off to a good start. However, uh, it was all kind of anticipated. I think that almost all of that decline is down to a reduction in COVID related testing. So that I mean, nobody should have been surprised by that. Uh, but if you look, at, if you kind of strip out the COVID side. The business is actually doing better than at almost any time, I think, in its history, just about. Mm. Uh, so it's kind of base pathology volumes were up 11%, which this is a business that typically in mature markets is just going to grow at 2%, 3%, yeah. maybe 4% if you're super lucky. So to grow in uh, double digits is... I think a pretty impressive result. So I feel like Graham, the... was that was that um was that because they included new territories in the network or was that the bounce back from COVID? Or maybe yeah, COVID? no, part part of it is because well, it's not to do with COVID so much. Okay. Uh that was the excluded revenue. Yeah. But okay. there are some acquisitions. I mean, they do have an acquisitive model. So some of that is through bolt-on uh acquisitions of smaller mm -hmm. clinics. But even if you strip those out, it's still seven percent growth. So still mm -hmm. well above uh their historical kind of norm on a like-for-like -like basis 
So yeah, I think it was a good result disguised by an ugly headline, basically. It, I've been I was looking at mm-hmm. briefly um, integral diagnostics as well, and and that's another one where I would have expected stronger growth to come back. It got knocked around in COVID, and I think for very obvious and understandable reasons. But the bounce back has been really slow. Is that something um, that's impacting Sonic? The other one I'll point out is Pacific Smiles as well. Also, the bounce mm-hmm. back has been slower than I would have thought. Um, it seems to be something in hospitals or healthcare. Everything is is um, it's not like retail where where the return from COVID has been really swift. It seems to be a lot. Yeah, smaller. I'm not sure about Pacific Smiles, but uh, in terms of radiology and Sonic is a direct competitor to mm. Integral. Uh, it has actually the growth rates have kind of normalized a bit since COVID, but I think mm. both of them and the whole industry broadly were was affected by staff and nursing shortages. So it wasn't they were dealing with the same kind of capacity as they had pre-COVID. But from what I can gather from these results, from Sonic in particular, that a lot of that is starting to alleviate. So it wouldn't surprise me if you look a year or so out and it has actually gone back to kind of a more normal level of volumes. I remember reading some research um, a few years ago that essentially all these volumes would just be come back and there'd be pent up demand mm. once once it opens. But there's probably the wrong way to think about it because when you lock people inside for a year, there's less car crashes, there's less sports injuries, there's less mm. all of that. So it doesn't actually make too much sense that there's massive pent up demand. There will be some. Yeah, but it's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. For yeah. those expecting um the the normalization of, or or a you know, kind of revenge testing. I don't. I don't think that's. Uh, yeah. yeah, you're right. Though. When you when you think about it, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't make a lot of sense. Does it? That, the, I, yeah, that's I, probably I, the case for pathology. But for radiology, a lot of their stuff is either uh, pre-surgery or diagnostic because it's you've got cancer or something like that. So I'm not sure how much that would have been affected by being stuck inside. There's probably some degree of it, but. I do have um, a tip for um, Sonic Management, should they be listening. What my local dentist has done, he's offered um, Matchbox cars for all the kids getting their teeth um, uh, checked. Mm. And we have gone to the dentist in the last few months more often than we have ever gone because my, my boys just want to go to the dentist all the time. Collect them all. <laughs> I've, got, <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a toothache. We have to go see that dentist. And now we've got uh... a huge collection of Matchbox cars to uh, for it. And I feel as though, I don't know, maybe that will work with Sonic. You know, throw in um, throw in something, come and get tested. Might work. Maybe they should be giving it to the referring doctors and <laughs> encouraging them that way. <laughs> they can't give financial kickbacks, but maybe they can give Matchbox cars. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Nick, um, your, well, I was going to say your number two, but that sounds pretty nasty. How about your, your second choice? <laughs> uh, yeah, just before that, we'll just take a quick short break. Yes, let's do that. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the responsible adult in the room. Yes, let's take a quick short break. If you like the sound of our investing approach and aren't yet a member, visit intelligentinvestor.com.au to take us on a free 15-day test drive. Get immediate access to all of our current buy recommendations, model portfolios, and engaging educational research tailor-made for people that want to manage their own money. That's intelligentinvestor.com.au for a free 15-day trial. No credit card required. Yeah, so my second one is Wise Tech, a company we don't formally cover, but a company we've uh, written up a few times as an ideas lab. We'd love to own this business. It's uh, it's just wonderful, but the valuation is um, our, our buy price is so far away from the current share price, it's, mm-hmm. it's not worth doing. Its result, it actually fell 20% on the day of its result. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> I want it to be down a lot more. But... It was just a, a case of the market getting way ahead of itself with expectations. So revenue rose 30% this year um, and everything looked very good in, in the numbers. Um, cash flow was great. Uh, they acquired a few businesses which will kick into earnings next year. But the forward guidance has the business slowing down from around 40% earn, uh, revenue growth in their core cargo-wise um, software down to 19%. And they called out that there was an industrial, uh, like an industrial slowdown, which they they do get some revenue from volumes, so that that is um, coming back. 
but the market just can't, or the share price just couldn't support a valuation and the disappointment that sort of followed after the after the release of these numbers. Brokers actually downgraded their numbers by about thirty five percent, and the share price response was only nine to it was only down around fifteen percent. It's back to where it was in July. Yeah, it's back to where it was, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm. And now and now trades at 90, 90 to one hundred times earnings. Um, and compared to where we had it, where we when we looked at it last November. It was trading around 70 times earnings. And I was like, oh, if this business falls back maybe to a $40 share price, it could look really, really interesting. Because What's amazing about that number, Nick, and um, you pointed this out internally when you were presenting the stock, was that this is not a business that needs to scale. Margins aren't going to increase. We're not going to see um, a higher no. leverage. Um, it's already at max margins. It's already generating the returns it's going to generate. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. I mean... Um, yeah, revenue growth this year was 30% and impact growth was 30%. So it's been like this for a number of years. They actually said margins were going to fall next year because they're yeah, wow. swallowing these lower margin acquisitions or digestion. Have, have, have you mentioned the matchbox car idea? That could that could work. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't. It, it was, have it you got shares in matchbox, Gore? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but it was it was just. I think Reese and Wise Tech, the reason I brought those two stocks, it, it really highlights that I think the market is getting very, very optimistic with a lot of these quality businesses and willing to pay unbelievable multiples for them despite weaker results. Like I think if you ask anyone that if, uh, you know, would Reese's share price stay the same and its PE um, actually increase when earnings um, is when earnings are coming down, Six months ago, they would have said no. And the same thing for WiseTech, if they were going to miss earnings expectations by 30 or 40%. But they are. And it's just it's just ridiculous. And it's, as I said before, it's really pissing me off because it's giving us less opportunities to buy some really high-quality businesses despite short-term disappointments. Let me play devil's advocate for a second here, Nick. Um, is there an argument, and I know management have claimed this as mm -hmm. well, that this isn't just a dominant business. This is a potential monopoly business, and they could actually take all of industry profits if the idea works. And that's why you can justify these crazy multiples for the stock. It is, and and, and that is the argument. The, the founder, uh, Richard White, has previously talked about they want to become sort of ubiquitous. They want to become the Microsoft um, hmm. office um, of the industry, um, and they do think it is a winner-takes-all industry. Uh, and you know, on the opt on the optimistic side, there was um, you know there were points in this result where you go, uh, actually, this Wise Tech could be the winner here. I mean, they signed the number one global freight forwarder, um, Kuna Nagel. Uh, they expanded their relationship with FedEx. They now have, I think. 47 of the top sort of global freight forwarders um, signed up um, on cargo wise. And those rollouts will increase over the next um, few years. So when when they do sign a customer, it takes five, six years, sometimes even a decade to get all the customers' volumes onto that uh, software. And then that means revenue growth is usually quite good throughout that period. So you're right, it could be a win takes all market. But you're paying an awful lot for the, for it, and yeah. and the revenue and the revenue, at least the top line growth, is much slower than probably what you would need to justify that multiple. Yeah. So that that yeah. that argument that it's a winner's take all that's a possibility, but it's been priced in as a certainty. And... Yeah, that's it. Yeah. I mean, to get this back to a reasonable multiple mm. um, in by the end of the decade, you need to price in some very optimistic assumptions. Mm. Um, and there's just not too many businesses throughout history that actually end up doing it. Yeah. 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 Nice one. Okay. Um, I remember when you presented that to the team for the first time, it really, uh, that's when I think all of us realized that there is something to WiseTech. We've been a bit slow in the uptake of that one, but uh, glad to have it on the radar again. Um, yeah. My second stock is Aussie Broadband, which um, I thought is in the running for result of the season for me. Um, it didn't surprise it met guidance and it shouldn't have, uh, been a, a, a huge shock to anyone following that business, but the reason it was so good and the reason why this particular result is so important is because Aussie broadband is 
in a bit of a pivot phase. It's doing something quite different for its entire history. And it's been around for almost 20 years. This has been a seller of, of NBN. It started in regional Victoria. It's fought off 90 competitors to, to be the number four reseller um, and the fastest growing one. Um, it's it's a collection of the highest uh, margin customers in the entire industry, and it's you can see the damage um, it's it's wreaking on its competitors because um, Telstra is makes um, very thin margins and is barely profitable in broadband. Um, ditto TPG and and ditto Optus, and the reason is that um, Aussie is just scooping up the most profitable customers. About half their um, subscriber base is. Um, hundred pl uh, plays more than hundred dollars a month, and then those are the ones that are the most sought after customers in the industry. And I think the NBN average is something like uh, fourteen percent or something. So it's a, it's a, you can see um, where those those high margin customers are going across the entire NBN network. They're going to Aussie, but the company has recently been pivoting less towards that NBN market and more towards um, wholesale services, enterprise, and government. And it's relying on um, wholly owned, newly built fiber assets um, to make those services attractive and to attract high margins. And it was a, quite a risky move because if the business wasn't able to make that pivot, it would have spent a lot of money on fresh fiber assets for no benefit. And um, um, it, we, we needed to know whether this move was working or not. And this was the result to test that thesis you know um and it the result came back and and yes it is working the idea is working they are, ma are making um terrific traction in the new areas of focus and um to be honest for, for me who was, who've been following the company since ipo this is not a surprise I, i'm just i'm so impressed with this management i think they have shown um that they, it, it, there's no obvious moat around this business, right? There's there's nothing that that they do that the competition cannot do or a startup cannot do, but they just do everything better. And listening to, actually, Tolstoy these days actually has pretty good management, so it's a poor example. But I'll, I'll, I'll shout out to Optus because they are just, I think they're all at sea. Um, uh, that they, <laughs> uh, Singtel's results shows that the Optus Australia is, is um, you know, it's that, quite a large business, but a surprisingly low profitability one and tpg is in all sorts of trouble they're just not scaling that mobile network and they're not making as much money as they used to on the nbn product so they're they're in a trouble as well and i think um aussie broadband is is the one in the industry that's now challenging um the big guys and is scooping up a disproportionate uh, um, amount of the profit pool in the entire industry and um, to me, it looks a lot like um, Macquarie Telecom, Macquarie, Tele Macquarie Technology Group, which started off in um, conventional telco and moved into specialized high margin services, enterprise and government. And that's now the bulk of their business. And it's a, it's a high margin, high moat business now, whereas in the past, it used to be um, a, a sort of low margin, low moat business. And I think that transition, you can see that happening with Aussie Broadband and it looks like they've got now the physical assets, the financial capability, and the management skill to to complete that task. I'm really impressed with this one. Um, yeah, we uh, we I, I own it, I should say, and, and it's it's in the um, IA funds as well. But a uh, great result and a really important one. If 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 the if we had found out in this result that that transition to the new products was not working, if they had not um, hit it out of the park, I would have been tempted to actually cut and and sell. At that point, I think that's almost a broken thesis. Um, so it was very encouraging to see um, that things are working um, with the strategy. Aussie sort of fits in one of those baskets for me that doesn't really make too much sense. So you're always taught at business school or mm. even even talking to other investors, you're supposed to find a high quality business with um, with a large moat. But it, this doesn't have one, and neither does Dickadada, and neither does Main Freight. But through you know superior customer service and management. Um, and just eking out a profitability where others can't. Like Optus, I think you mentioned, was what, 50 million in operating yeah. profits? Or It's just crazy. It's crazy low, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and, and last year, um, at Telstra, as I say, the, the management quality of Telstra has really improved over the last few years. But last year, Telstra made less money selling NBN than Aussie Broadband did. 
And I just think that's that astonishing. Is, <laughs> and it's, a, it's just astonishing, right? <laughs> just astonishing. But this year they've um they actually did a lot better. Um and as I said, Telstra is no longer a laughing stock um because it, I think it is properly that operational and management is quite good. But that's new. That hasn't happened for 20 or 30 years. Um and, and so we can, you know, we, we can sort of have a giggle about that. But um Nick, the I think the in, in, the, what you said about customer service is is quite important. I think the industry and investors um, think customer service is just a matter of saying please and thank you on the phone, or um, or sending you a birthday card, you know, when by via email or something like that. I, I I don't think they quite grasp what customer service means. And for Aussie, customer service isn't just saying please or thank you. It's um, it's a demonstration of a cultural superiority that runs through the entire business. Because everyone who answers the phone in a call center has the training and the authority to follow almost any problem through to its end. There's no, may I speak to a supervisor or, or we'll get back to you or can I check this out? Everyone in that call center can handle almost any problem with, with mm -hmm. maximum authority. And you go through the entire business, people running, um, people working at any level are almost little autonomous units. And it says something about the culture of the place the training provided and the quality of the people it's attracting that it's able to operate that way because Telstra definitely cannot operate that way. And that's why when people say, oh, but Telstra can do customer service. Yes, they can say please and thank you, but they cannot, they cannot offer that level of um, that the, the real deep service that um, Aussie can, because it's a product of culture. It's not a, a product of language or manners. <laughs> you know? And I think people probably underestimate just actually how big that mode is to change the customer yep. service in an organization like Telstra would be a monumental task. It's just well, not going to happen. The, the one that um, is, is nowhere near is, is TPG, which has been the mm -hmm. traditional um, challenger brand. Um, I mean, look at their NPS scores, their net promoter scores, it's just miles off. Um, I mean, Telstra deserves some credit. We don't want to be picking on Telstra because they actually lifted their scores and um, I think they have done better, but yeah, I, I really fret about the future of TPG. I think they're certainly not the business they used to be. I wrote an obituary for TPG um, recently. Um, so if you want to shed a tear of TPG, you can go read that. Mm -hmm. um, right. Uh, I think that's two each, isn't it, fellas? Yes. Yeah. Got my maths correct? Yes, I think that's right. <laughs> um, now, before we we sign off, um, are there any questions we've picked out from the comments? I do have one. Um, but I'll give you guys a chance to go first. Graham, do you have one? Uh, yeah, I do. This is for Steve for reminding us that we uh, should do some questions at the end of the show. Thank you for uh, so reminding I've us. Got a, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, yeah, Michael M asked a question a little while ago, which I thought was quite interesting. He said, how can a buyback make sense if intelligent investor doesn't see the company itself as a buy? And I thought that was a... Yeah, it was just an interesting question because it's actually two questions in one. When do buybacks make sense? And also, uh, what do our price guides mean? So in terms of our price guides, I think that is kind of worth going over because there can be some confusion. When we're saying hold on a stock, it doesn't mean that we think that it's fully valued. That when we say buy, it's kind of obvious that we think the stock is undervalued. But when we say hold, that's not that we think it's fully valued. It means that we think it's slightly undervalued and that we're happy to hold. But in the same way that a, say a $10 note could be underpriced as a $7 note versus a $9 note or something or other, there's a difference in that margin of safety. We might think that it's only worth buying the $10 note when it's being sold for $7, giving a big margin of safety. But that doesn't mean that it's silly to buy it at $8 or $9. You're still getting a deal. We just don't think there's enough of a gap there. So yeah, that's that's the price guide side that just because we say hold doesn't mean we don't like the stock or we're not happy to buy it at that price. It just means we think it's worth waiting for a bigger margin of safety if you're going to add it to your portfolio. The other side of it is when buybacks make sense. And that's basically whenever the company uh, is able to repurchase its stock at a lower valuation than its intrinsic value actually is and that it's got the financing capacity to do it. So if you've got, so, so in that case, uh, we can say that, yeah, the buyback can make sense if it's just a 10% discount to what it's worth. 
And management is probably going to have a better idea of that than outsiders because they've got all the inside information. So they can accept kind of a smaller margin of safety than an outsider, I would say. Uh, so kind of putting those two things together, yeah, a buyback can make sense even if it's in hold territory. If it's in sell territory for us, then we probably aren't going to say that it is smart to uh, for the company be, to be buying back stock. But while it's still a hold, that can still be perfectly fine and add value to shareholders who are hanging on. What do you guys think? Are you guys in the same kind of camp? I'd add one more thing to that is that um, our, we have lots of competing uses of capital as private investors. Uh, there's a whole universe of stocks and assets that we can buy. Um, so any idea needs to be particularly attractive um, to get a spot for our incremental dollar. Whereas the company is only a limited a pool of possible investments they can make, right? They can pay a dividend, mm -hmm. buy back stock or invest back in the business. Uh, and so those uh, those opportunity costs are much are very different for the business and for us as individual investors. Um, anything to add, Nick? No, I think you guys have covered it well. Um, thanks, Graham. Good question to pick up and, and uh, good question Thank to you, ask. Michael. Um, look, I know there's a lot of questions um, on my articles. I, I find it very difficult to go through um, the comments while reporting season is on. I, I can't do multiple things at once. I just find it mentally challenging. Sorry about that. But I will get to them um, um, maybe next week when um, I'll set aside a day and I'll just go through some of those um, questions. But one I wanted to point out here was there's been quite a few comments about Illumina and specifically making comparisons between Illumina and New Hope and Illumina and Whitehaven. And I think the inference seems to be that, um, you know, Whitehaven and New Hope have done spectacularly well, and this is another resource commodity business, and it's destined to do spectacularly well, spectac spectacularly well as well. I'm not going to pretend to be falsely modest. We have a, a stellar track record on resource stocks. Um, it's got to be one of the best in the industry. Like we, we, we do it really, really well. And, but we, the reason we do it well is because we do it so selectively. We don't do it very often. Um, Illumina, let me be clear, is not the same opportunity set as those coal miners. This is a far more speculative business. When we were buying those coal miners, it was a traditional cyclical funk. From my point of view, I, I thought we were buying um, pretty decent assets uh, at a time when the market was funked out. There's nothing nothing overly clever about that i don't think all you need is the is the stomach to do it you don't need to you don't need any real insight or you don't need any special intelligence you just need uh, um the behavioral and the, uh, the 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 stomach really as i said but that's not the case for lumina i mean it is a high quality asset base and the commodity price is bombed out but there's another layer of complexity with the with the regulatory risk and that is something that, um, you know, your stomach isn't going to help you with that. Um, your analytical, analytical skill isn't going to help you with that. That's a, that's a risk we're just taking on. Um, we're taking that on. Um, and the reason why it sits on the buy list, I note that it's a speculative buy now because those regulatory risks have increased in the last few months. It's a speculative buy. And that's because um, if the WA government does not grant those licenses, um, the business's low cost status will be challenged. Um, it will still be able to access all uh, volumes shouldn't be interrupted too much over the next um, decade or so. But it's really about the cost profile because the new the new areas provide higher grades. and um, instead, the business will be forced to continue to mine lower grades. And so you have a permanent shift in the cost of this business. and and I can't handicap those odds. Why is it on the buy list in that case? Because WA, the only reason that remains a spec buy still and not a hold or a sell is because WA is the best mining jurisdiction in the world, bar none. And if you look at the history of WA decisions, they've, you know, they've always favored, almost always favored um, uh, mining over non-mining. Um, the economy is built that way. The political culture leans that way. And so I think the odds are in our favor, but they're not, it, it is, it is, there is a marginality to this. This is not the same thing. This is not a, a no brainer. This is not a traditional buying uh, good assets when the price is funked out. You know, there's a, there's a new layer of complexity. So I really want to be very clear about this, that Illumina is not new hope. Um, there is uh, more uncertainty about its outcome and hence it's a speculative buy. So please act accordingly. And I made a special 
note in that review to to point out that we should stick to very carefully to those limits. Um, you know, I'm, I don't always stick to to limits, but I certainly would be sticking to those aluminum limits. So, so please um, tread carefully with that one because it's not um, it is not uh, New Hope or Whitehaven. It's ten times better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Nick, I can you can see you sweating there. You what? You've you've you've, you've parlayed your mortgage into um in, into Lumina, haven't you? <laughs> How no, many times no. have we spoken about this? <laughs> hey, listen. Um, I think we're supposed to break uh, one more time for a break. So let's do that, and we'll come back and and say goodbye. If you enjoy our approach to investing, but don't want to manage your own money, check out Intelligent Investors' range of managed funds, including income, growth, ethical, and international options. Decades of research and experience is distilled into the management of these four managed funds, each focused on achieving outsized investment returns. Check out our performance, track record, fees, and approach at intelligentinvestor.com.au forward slash funds hyphen overview that's intelligentinvestor.com.au forward slash funds hyphen overview all right now that we forced you to listen to a commercial break um it's time to sign off uh thanks very much for for joining me today fellas um graham um pleasure to have you on as always thank you and nick um missed the filing cabinet but nice to hear from you as well thanks very much for everyone else thank you for listening